This is the Amp Hour Podcast, released September 11th, 2017, episode 359, an interview with Jeroen Domberg. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Dave Jones from the EEV blog. And I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Jeroen Domberg of uh, an Espressif. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, Jeroen. Mm-hmm. I can't pronounce it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not bad, Dave. It starts bad. with a J. Bad. How about, how about, uh, how, how about Sprite? Can we call you Sprite? Yeah, Sprite will do. Okay. Sprite. <laughs> and, and we were wondering, so what, what, is the, what is the genesis of that name? Where, where does that come from? Oh, that is a long, long time ago. Uh-huh. Um, at, uh, at a certain point where I just learned like in um, how to program and anything else than basic, um, I looked at my old Game Boy and I was like, hey, there's something in there I can program. Hmm. And I, I whipped up one of the most ugly hacks. Um, um, yeah, at least in, in hindsight, uh, like in, I took one of the cartridges and um, I, I broke it open, replaced the uh, um, ROM with like in a flash chip. Uh, so I could like in um, illegally pirate games. I mean, develop my own games. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Um, right. Right. And um, um, uh, well, the 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 Game Boys um, uh, like in graphic system had like in a bunch of things. You had a bunch of tiles, and you could make those into like in either backgrounds or sprites. And at a certain point, I was with a friend, and um, obviously the hip thing to do was to get into the demo scene and make oh, all yeah. kinds of cool things. <laughs> but obviously, you you. you you need a nickname uh, for that so i Obviously. thought back to what i just did uh, so uh, yeah I, did, I decided i would be sprite nice and um i think um uh, yeah i nowadays usually write it with an underscore tm after it and that's just purely because uh, seemingly other people also thought it would be a good na- a good idea to name themselves sprite so yeah just a little distinction so nice. my usernames could be unique <laughs> that's awesome that's great that's great <laughs> And so, uh, well, so what's your story? Where, where are you coming from? I mean, you uh, you have an interesting accent. We know you're from not uh, China, where you're calling from. Uh, so, yeah, tell us how you got from where you started to where you are now. Uh, well, originally I am Dutch. So um, <laughs> if you want, my accent can be a, a waiver. <laughs> you can bring it back, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no worries. That's like when, um, when Dave goes to the bush, he, uh, he, he gets yeah, his, right. his strine comes on pretty, pretty heavy and hard, you know? <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was born and raised in the east of the Netherlands and um, um, essentially always had an affinity for like in um, uh, electronics and, and stuff like that. My mom used to say that, that as a baby if I cried then all she needed to do was like inflict the light switch a few times and I would be so mesmerized that I would stop crying <laughs> um, and um, yeah essentially always grew up with like in breaking stuff and, and trying to put them back together ag- again and sometimes I actually managed to get it back together and um, um, uh, yeah at a certain point um, you, you gotta choose what you wanna do so um, I uh, chose to go to uh, to university to study electronic engineering uh, obviously <laughs> obviously yeah um, so um, I went there and let's just say that my university, um, uh, well, I really like university because you could learn a whole bunch of new things. Um, it was just that not all the things that I learned interested me. Yeah. Uh, the way my university gave the subjects was really like in, okay, so here is like in a big block of all kinds of mathematics. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then That's like in familiar. three years yeah. later, it's like, oh, I could use that for that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's I, I I'm I'm I, I'm I'm pretty good at picking up stuff, but I really need to know why I I am learning stuff, right. and I can't just do it like in off the bat. Like when just, you're cranking you know. on something, especially like math, like they want you to do, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And and like in later on, um, uh, you know, if you know, hey, I, I I gotta use this for this, then I'll then I'll pick it up and happily learn it, etc. But not you know everything in an abstract like in blob of of math altogether. 
Um, so during that time, I also obviously did, did a bunch of projects, like in uh, one of the first things that I actually published on my own server in my university um, uh, room was uh, essentially how to convert a uh, um, optical uh, mouse sensor into a, a well, shitty camera. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> That's cool. Nice. And that actually went big, as in that got slash dotted, which actually which meant big. something at the time. It was big back in the <laughs> yeah. day, yep. yep. Um, and um, yeah, well, I uh, uh, got a whole bunch of, of, of visitors and stuff. And I'm like, hey, this is actually cool. Seemingly people are interested in the shit I do. So um, from then on, I decided to uh, give every... <laughs> Sorry, I hope you can't hear that. He, <laughs> did that you get eat, eat my air conditioner? Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's it's one of the bad sides of living in a, a, a 17th floor apartment oh, is that goodness. there will always be people who decide to redo their house. Oh, Ooh. really? Wow. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. I mean, I like the fact that the apartments are so high because you know you get a really nice view, etc. But um, yeah, yeah, your neighbors are um, all up in your business. Right? Seven eight <laughs> stories is small for China, isn't it? Yeah, true. It's <laughs> it's not that big. Um, yeah, again, I, I hail from the Netherlands, so you know if you have a a, a big ass um, uh, flat in in my uh, neck of the woods, that's going to be like in eight floors or so. So right. you know, seventeen floors already is like holy crap. But yeah, no, we have like in I don't know hundred something floors um, uh, uh, buildings here in 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 uh, in, in Puxi in in the um, uh, bank center. So <laughs> it's not that big. Um, so you're talking about publishing. You were publishing your uh, optical mouse yeah, yeah, camera yeah, yeah, thing yeah. and slash dotting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So at a certain point, I decided to do that, which actually helps because before that, I kind of had the um, uh, well. Um, I think everyone knows that the 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 um, uh, the fact that you pick up a project, you you work a bit on it, then then you run into a snag or something, or you have to wait, and you're like, ah, I'll finish this later. <laughs> and then the project Throw it on the pile. ends up on a bench <laughs> yeah, somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And the other thing uh, that I had was, you know, I made something, and then it's done, and I use it for a while, and then I decide I'm bored, and I take it apart for other parts without ever, you know, uh-huh. uh, remembering how it goes back together, etc. So um, I decided that, that, you know, publishing stuff actually was a very good idea, uh, uh, not only for you know uh, the fact that the world can know about this, but also to you know um, have an opportunity to to get a bit more disciplined in actually finishing a project and documenting it. Oh, kind of like the uh, the document is the prize. That's kind of like the that's the thing at the end that you're going towards versus the thing. Uh, yeah, kind of, sorta. Um, like in, um, I'm 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 halfway between. Like in um, um, an electronics guy who makes stuff because you know making stuff is cool and a a um, I don't know what you would call that like in a writer a journalist type of sure. thing mm-hmm. who um, actually does things with the sole reason to make it into an article. Yep. And yeah, I kind of like that 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 in between and and actually writing stuff is also uh, much fun. I mean. Um, you know, trying to figure out how people will read your stuff and 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 uh, not make it boring by going into too many technical details where there's no need for that and stuff. It's it's a uh, uh, it's an art in itself. I agree. Um, yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, I decided to publish all my stuff uh, at first on my uh, on my web server in the university. At a certain point. Um, um, yeah, um, I kind of saw that I would have to leave university at a certain point, so <laughs> I decided to start up Sprite Smots. Um, uh, something that also helped is that uh, one of my very first articles got um, noticed by, um, uh, yeah, it's Elektur in the Netherlands. It's Elector uh, internationally, I think, uh, oh, yeah. which is like in a dead tree um, uh, electronics hobbyist uh, magazine. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, they did. They, they liked the way I wrote and the, the stuff that I made. Um, and they asked me if I also wanted to to write for them. And I uh, did a run of like in I think a year and a half, two years or something, mm-hmm. uh, of articles um, uh, uh, for that magazine. And yeah, that that was also pretty enjoyable. 
But unfortunately, um, um, let me say that my university career slowly tapered off. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and at a certain point, I decided, yeah, this is um, uh, maybe I should try something else. Um, and, um, you know, tried a few things left and right to st- still still have uh, some kind of paper to show uh, future employers. Mm-hmm. And at a certain point, I decided, nah, maybe it's better if I just, you know, um, use what I have and, and try to find some work. And this was like a bachelor's degree, master's degree? What were you, what were you yeah, deciding? Yeah, this, this, um, uh, this was a bachelor's de- de- degree. And um, yeah, um, uh, I never got my bachelor's, unfortunately. <laughs> um um so but but the nice thing was um i went looking for work essentially just you know initially just trying to see what i could get you know uh, i mean you're sign you're sort of on a on a on a, on a crossroads of okay where am i going now and and this was more like in a probe to see okay mm-hmm. how marketable am i and well, actually, it really helped that I had a portfolio of all the, the stuff I did, like in on a nice web page uh, formatted nicely with all the source code up for download. So your, re- your website becomes you, your resume, basically. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's my it's my portfolio. It's a, it's a nice example of all the stuff I did, including downloadable code and, and you know everything. Right. And that really helped. And um, yeah, essentially, I, I uh, put my resume up on a job uh, job uh, website, and I almost immediately got a whole bunch of, of, of offers. So nice. Yeah, ended up taking one of them, uh, which was for a. Um, small uh, broadcasting equipment manufacturer um, I really liked it there it was like 25 people so you so you knew everyone um, yeah that's the best place to I think those are the best places to learn too because you have to do so much of the the process too right? exactly exactly yeah. um, it also made me learn um, yeah it, it also taught me another thing and that is that I don't like to work for bigger companies because that small broadcasting uh, comp- uh, 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 manufacturing company had a bunch of very interested bigger companies and at a certain point the company got bought by like in this big multinational which um, itself got bought by an even bigger multinational <laughs> so like in uh, in, the, in the span of like in two years or so um, uh, before I worked for like in a 25 people company and afterward I worked for a multi thousand people company yes yeah. And yeah, that's that's when I find f- found out that if you like um, um, I like doing multiple things, uh, for example, n- not only hardware and software, but also you know help a bit with the networking infrastructure like that, uh, doing some other things. Um, then at least in my experience, there may be companies where that's not the case, obviously, but at least in my experience, bigger companies are not a very good fit because, for example, um, I was mostly a software guy, but I also like to do hardware. And for example, I I designed a bunch of of, of PCBs as well. In the bigger company, that's that's not an option because they can give the job to do a PCB, you know, either to you and you'll yeah. take like in a month or something um, uh, uh, with your other work involved. Or they can just send it to the big ass PCB design yep, um, yep. department right. uh, overseas and they'll have it done in like what a day. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, at a certain point, my, my work just got um, a lot more boring. Let, right. let me put it like this. So and, the, was uh, this uh, Grass Valley? <laughs> um, yeah, that actually was a good guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't a guess. I've got your LinkedIn page, so it's hard. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm cheating. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember Grass Valley uh, Group back in the day. I yeah. presume it's the same one. They make video editing yeah equipment exactly no the there, there's yep. there's there's um, 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 I'm not gonna say anything bad about grass Valley itself because um, I've also been to uh, for example um, uh, uh, like in the states they have a, a headquarters in Nevada well, City I thought and, that, yeah uh, I thought they were a US only company I didn't know they had overseas uh, no, overseas I think design nowadays groups. they're multinational um, okay. if anything I know that for example the cameras themselves are uh, an old Philips um, right. um, uh, branch uh, which they bought and they are made in Breda in the Netherlands. Ah, interesting. Um, wow. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, uh, uh, 
Grass Valley, nothing against Grass Valley. I've, 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 I've been to, you know, um, uh, the place itself. They have a whole bunch of, of very interesting people. But, you know, especially if you work like in on the other side of the of, of, of the of the mm. of the earth, essentially, right. yeah, exactly. uh, you know, in a department with like in 25 people. Yeah, sorry. That's that's mm. yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to to. Uh, at least for me, it was kind of hard to to get the interesting things, right. when, uh, the interesting work I was looking for. Yeah, when I was at my first job, we were uh, like a kind of a competition to the Grass Valley Group, doing uh, security uh-huh. and and you know uh, video type switching gear mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I always wondered, like their products were so complicated. And I always wondered, <laughs> wow, this must be a huge company that uh, you know how many designers actually design this stuff you know because they were like massive you know uh, hardware builds and things yeah, for all this video it's, switching gear it was just phenomenal i was yeah, like really, in, really in awe of what they were able to do you know mm-hmm. they were like the uh, rolls royce of you know video switching <laughs> gear at the time i don't know what they're like these days but yeah, that was. I think they still have a pretty good edge. Right. That, as far as I understand. That was the late 80s, early 90s. So, mm-hmm. yep, quite a while back. Anyway. Yeah, the the, the analog stuff. Yeah, I, 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 I uh, heard something from colleagues about, like, in the history of, of Grass Valley. It's a, it's a pretty interesting company. They, they actually started out with, you know, um, figuring out. The, well, I think initially they, they, they started out from a video amplifier and then they ah, were right. like, hey, okay. we can. We can, we can switch uh, video you know, too. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And make more money. And, and, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> obviously. Right. And and essentially, it started all from there. So uh, the beginnings, uh, yeah. at least the story, is pretty nice. Yeah, because they were all analog back in the day. It was like mm-hmm. you know, it, like that. That was the thing. You did video switching, and you know, it was all analog. You'd video amplifiers switching, fading the whole works. You know, it was all done in the analog yeah. domain. Now it's all digital. You know. So. Yeah, obviously. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, what happened after Grass Valley? Well, essentially, I decided to go and, and look for a new job, um, and um, I got a few nice offers back in the Netherlands, and actually was like in uh, kind of sort of on the verge of of um, signing the contract with one of them, and then. Um, yeah, in the meantime, um, uh, there was this, this interesting chip coming to the market and I actually got a few of them because they, they said they would be like in uh, Wi-Fi to serial mm-hmm. converters. And I was actually looking around for Wi-Fi to serial converters because at that time they mm-hmm. usually used uh, like in small Linux router right. uh, chips. Yeah. And the nice thing of those chips is that you can essentially reflash them and you can put your own user space um, stuff on them and you can just make, you know, an IoT application for the price of a uh, serial to Wi-Fi converter. Um, We're talking so about really the famous ESP8266. Um, yeah. yeah, not yet. The, oh, the, wasn't, this was, wasn't this, that one yet? It was this, previous this, one. This, this was before then. Okay. Um, uh, like, in, like in back then, you would usually have like in, uh, I think Ralink had a bunch of chips that essentially r- r- ran like in a fully blown Linux um, mm. um, oh. thing. Like uh, you could install, for example, OpenWRT on it. And that was like in very useful for IoT things. Um, they were less useful for battery life, for instance, because obviously, <laughs> right. you know. Um, and and I think the size was also well slightly on the on the larger size. Uh, I think it's kind of sort of matchbox sized, which is yep. okay, but not always useful. So this is like a, you said this is a serial to Wi-Fi type thing. So it would be like a, just really <laughs> simple. Any any board you have could basically talk to it, and you could you know bolt Wi-Fi. Yeah. On it. Well, essentially, they marketed it as such okay. because um, that way they don't have to do any support. Right. Uh, you know, if you if you um, uh, if you market like in an entire Linux device, then you get like in a whole bunch of clueless people with Linux <laughs> questions. Right. If you if you yeah. market Where's, it as a <laughs> where where are the icons? Where do I click? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but if you market it to uh, as a Wi-Fi to um, uh, to serial device, then all you need to do is 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 essentially um, uh, you know, document the the serial setup stuff, and yeah. that's it. Yeah. Uh, but 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 under the hood, they were entire uh, Linux devices. So if you know uh, um, uh, uh, if you knew what you were doing, then you could replace that with OpenWRT, write your own stuff for it. You know, plunk a web server on it, plunk uh, uh, an LED controller software on it, and you could do your own thing, essentially like the Raspberry Pi is uh, now. Um, 
So, yeah, I was always kind of sort of looking for, you know, the keyword Wi-Fi to serial converters. And then at a certain point, they, they um, uh, a bunch of them came out and, and the price was like in ridiculously low, I think, like in five, five dollars or something. Whoa. It was like <laughs> half the price yeah. I, I, I used to get. And yeah, um, they had this new chip, which was the ESP8266, and I went looking for information, and seemingly I wasn't the only one, because um, uh, they also popped up like in on a bunch of forums, and uh, pretty quickly afterwards, also on Hackaday. And, um, I, remember, I remember when that stuff started happening. It was like, I kept yeah, seeing yeah, this, yeah. These, these part numbers over and over, and I was just so confused, mm-hmm. like you said about the price. The price is just yeah, yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. It's, it's really low. Um, so um, in essence, uh, you had this entire open source community essentially poking at the thing and seeing what it can do. And at a certain point, uh, there was a leaked SDK, which was um, a, um, how do I say? Um, if you download it, it wasn't entirely a legal version of a Chinese Windows XP with, um, <laughs> I think, Cadence tools installed. Wow, um, really cheap. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think it was leaked by one of the Chinese resellers, but I'm not entirely sure what the what the source of the thing was. Jesus. And, uh, Wait, are you talking about like, uh, like the Cadence tools, like the whole chipset design thing? No, 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 oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Luckily, not that. Okay. that. That would really be a problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, but still, uh, Cadence does have, uh, like in uh, their own uh, compiler for uh, the Extensa. Um, oh, because they, they own the core. Uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Exactly, exactly. So um, uh, essentially, you got a virtual machine with the, uh, with the compiler tools installed and uh, also the SDK installed. And, and you could use that if you weren't too worried about the legality of the entire thing uh, in order to write applications uh, for that yeah. and so you set that aside of, of course we were i'm sure right? I, I i i read about that <laughs> and i was like um but i also read that uh, or or actually you know um the thing i was looking for was hey does does maybe gcc have a backend for this i mean gcc has a backend for nearly everything so why not extensa and uh that turned out to be the case and i wasn't the first person looking into that and um um uh, there was only one one snag and that was that it wasn't entirely compatible because the uh, extensa inside esp32 uses well a certain mechanism um that the gcc wasn't entirely used to yet and there was actually this guy from uh, cadence uh, uh, itself i think who actually made um, who, who who also maintains uh, i think he maintains the extensa gcc port as well and he made a small change and then all of a sudden you could you know use the sdk uh, binaries which actually i think already did came out uh, uh, under a uh, under an openish uh, license at least you could legally reuse them and you could essentially just yoink them from the VM and use them with GCC to write your own stuff. So we got, we so. Got, we had to take a step back too. Uh, mm-hmm. Extensa is the old Tensilica. That's their. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> maybe going too fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so um, uh, Extensa is indeed uh, like in an old. Uh, or uh, yeah, uh, is made by Tensilica, and Tensilica used to be a company that was really big into uh, you know reconfigurable cores. Yeah. So um, you have a certain application, for example, you wanna I don't know make music or yeah, something. DSP type and, stuff or yeah. yeah, exactly. And they have this really neat trick where you can um, essentially uh, you can write your code and then you can run it through their simulator and their simulator notices that hey this and this and this is the hotspots and it'll essentially take those hotspots and convert that into a specialized um, CPU instruction. Oh, so, no, I remember they did that in uh, FPGAs too. Like yeah. they were yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah. hot um, at one point. So um, essentially you can get a, a, a core that's entirely optimized for your design and um, seemingly that works really well for uh, yeah, like a specialized cores. Um, but the other the other nice thing they have is that they are, um, as far as I understand, as far as embedded cores go, they are pretty cheap. So um, that was one of the reasons why the ESP8266 uh, uses uh, uh, uses an Extensa core. Okay. Um, huh. Well, uh, um, 
Yeah, um, uh, as far as I understand, on the side of Espressif, by the way, uh, initially they really meant the Wi-Fi to serial converters to actually be applications, like in uh, only be used as Wi-Fi to serial converters. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden, uh, they saw a whole bunch of interest from this weird ass community, uh, uh, like in freaks uh, in the West, <laughs> <laughs> and and they're like, holy crap, what's going on here? And um, they kept they kept an eye on it, and at a certain point when GCC came out they were like hey um, you know this 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 community is essentially clamoring for an SDK they can use and seemingly now there's GCC that works and we just you know need to add like in our own um, uh, IP uh, as in our own libraries etc uh, to make that work with our chip so um, not long after they made an official release which still was a VM but in this case it was an Ubuntu VM so they could distribute uh-huh, it yep. with the right. GCC uh, tool chain which was open and their own libraries and you could use that to, to um, essentially uh, uh, yeah, build your own applications uh, for this chip and so the GCC was, existed because this, this tool chain or sorry, this uh, core was already out in the marketplace, right? That's the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, the extensor uh, core is is um, uh, kind of sort of like the ARM core. Uh, there, there, there really isn't a single um, uh, core. Sure, um, sure. It's a family uh, of a family of different products and yeah, yeah exactly. Reviews. And um, because Linux is pretty tied to, um, I think that's the reason. Uh, Linux is pretty tied to a few uh, ways of comp- uh, compiling that GCC does. Uh, um, um, they had to have a port of GCC in order to compile Linux for that that uh, chipset. Mm-hmm. And um, so that, yeah, that if you have, okay, hmm? sorry, I was just going to say the 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 switch over that you said. They said there was like one thing that wasn't wasn't capable, and then they they did a switch there. Was that just like a certain instruction that was not in GCC, or what? What was that actual switch that happened? Yeah, it comes down that uh, to uh, because GCC was developed uh, in order to compile Linux. Essentially, it didn't have that good a support for like in the smaller uh, extensa uh, uh, um, uh, cores. So oh. um, this core left off a bit. Uh, yeah. The, 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 the windowed uh, registers um, infrastructure essentially um, essentially it left it off so um, uh, things like calling functions had to be done in a slightly different way and GCC didn't have support for that yet got it okay yeah. well that's great so, I mean like that's capable right I mean that's like a lot <laughs> of the work was probably what 95% of the work was done and then it was just kind of t- tweaking it for that thing right yeah exactly yeah it comes down to that did the and, popularity really explode when somebody ported it to the Arduino platform and got it like so that any Dumbo like me could use it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I am not entirely sure. I'm, 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 I'm sure that helped. <laughs> right. Um, let me, let me put that first. But um, well, there are there essentially are two things. Like, and you have people who really. Um, you know, want to hack with it and, and yeah. essentially, you know, there's a chip out. We can program for this yet and we're going to make this happen. But but and that's got to be a small, that's got to be a small, a relatively small community though. Yeah, exactly, In exactly. Things, but yeah. that, is, that is also the community that I was most, um, like you know, involved with because you know if you have a GCC compiler for a chip um, and and um, uh, I'm 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 already happy and if you also have a bunch of drivers for the chip so you can do Wi-Fi chip uh, Wi-Fi stuff etc. Essentially that's all I need. <laughs> right. Um, the rest you'll figure out. Right. That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And and I'm not I I, I kind of missed out on the entire Arduino thing like and that was after my time so to say. Yeah. <laughs> so. So uh, yeah, I, I uh, learned uh, programming, uh, yeah, uh, the hard way, so to say. Uh, so just write stuff directly in C, and I'm, I'm pretty used to that. And if I were to switch to Arduino right now, I would essentially have to learn another API. So um, um, while I agree that it's very useful for like in people to learn stuff, um, I prefer other tools. So. Don't don't worry, you're not you're not being criticized here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, when did you? So you, I mean, you worked there. So when did? How did mm-hmm. that that whole thing go down then? I mean, obviously you were in the Netherlands, and then. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> now you're in China, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, essentially, uh, as I said, it, this was around the time that I was looking for a new job anyway. And um, I saw this thing and I was like, okay, uh, you know, IoT is, is, is going to be, uh, I think, reasonably big with this thing. But I also saw an issue with that. Um, the uh, You had the problem of configuration. Uh, yeah. Um, essentially, uh, you have this device that can talk Wi-Fi. And now you have a problem that you have to configure that because, um, uh, you know, um, um, it, it won't automatically connect to your Wi-Fi network because your Wi-Fi network usually has a password or, or something. Hopefully. You need to yeah, hopefully. feed that into the device. <laughs> so... Um, uh, I kind of saw this issue that a lot of people will be running into the same issue that they need to um, uh, uh, configure the device to go on their Wi-Fi network. And I was like, eh, there are probably going to be a whole bunch of solutions that I'm not going to like very much. Either, you know, clunky stuff like Wi-Fi interfaces, uh, sorry, uh, serial interfaces where you have to enter your, your, your password. Or maybe someone writes an app for it or something. I was going to say, the, um, the worst one is when you have to do it with like a, with a four-button remote. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's not start there. Yeah. L, click, click, no. click, 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 click. Uh, <laughs> R. <laughs> yeah. Ah, crap. I have an underscore yeah. in my password, yeah. and that's not in the character <laughs> Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, so, um, uh, uh, essentially, I wanted to preempt that. And I thought a nice way to do that, because the ESP8266 can also do like in... Um, uh, it can it can be an access point. So I was like, okay, what if I wrote a uh, uh, what if I wrote a web server for the thing? So um, uh, I write a web server. I have a nice environment that people can just copy paste uh, that that you know shows you the access points and uh, has a field where you can enter the password. And, uh, you know, just, just make something like that. So the normal procedure of configuring these devices is going to be that you press a certain button or something. The thing will turn into an access point. You use your phone, your laptop, your, I don't know, whatever, your Tamagotchi to connect to that thing. <laughs> um, um, uh, click on the right thing, enter the password, maybe configure a bunch of other f- things and then press OK and your entire thing is configured. And I, I kind of sort of halfway did that because of self-preservation because I could see that there may be a lot of interesting uh, you know, things that would come out that could only be configured by using a Windows program or something. And, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I use Linux, so that would be a pain in the right, ass. Right. So, yep. you know, uh, <laughs> if I if I would make something like this, then people would use the, uh, this, and it's nice, nice and platform independent. So I could also use it. So, uh, long story short, I got a mail from the CEO of Espressive, and he was like, "Yeah, uh, 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 we saw that you, you know, made a web server, and this actually is on our own roadmap, but um, really? you know, uh, we're n- yeah, uh, we 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 don't really have time for that, so it keeps getting pushed back. So we're really happy that you did the, uh, this. Is there any any help or, or whatever you need with this?" And I'm like, "Yeah." Well, I kind yeah, of sort job. of make this in my free time, so, you know. Well, yeah. I do at like that money. Point, I, I like money. Sure, but, um, well, yeah, yeah but, but, you know, at first I'm like, yeah, I, I don't really need specifically help with this web server because I'm, I'm designing this, you know, in my own free time. And, and you know, if I get paid, that that, that, that kind of sort of implies a... a um, you know, then I all of a sudden need to develop this in order uh-huh. to, you know, uh, be worth my money. And, and I'm <laughs> not sure I can't say if I'm going to keep being interested in this. So I was like, nah, I'm fine. This stuff will, you know, run this course. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, putting it on the market under an open source license. And, you know, everyone who wants can, can you know, help with, with development of this. So now nah, I'm, I'm fine. Um so uh, a bit later, I was looking into sensors and I actually had a bunch of uh, questions. Um, uh, well, the problem with Wi-Fi sensors is that, you know, usually at a certain point they have to wake up, they have to connect to Wi-Fi, send, send whatever they send over to, you know, the main ship and then go to sleep uh, uh, again. And I had some issues with the wake up uh, bit uh, taking a fair amount of time, like in multiple seconds. And I was like, yeah, if you change a few APIs here and there, you can probably do this like in, in what, half or, or maybe a third of the time. So I made a bunch of suggestions uh, on the forum. And again, I had the uh, CEO in my mailbox and he said, yeah, well, what you did there is essentially describe our roadmap. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> you seem to have a feeling for this kind of stuff. Would you be interested in, you know, either being a consultant for us or maybe, you know, a crazy idea and move to Shanghai and work for you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm looking for a job anyway. <laughs> so, and you had never, yeah. have you been to Shanghai at that point or no? Um, I've been to Shanghai once. I actually um, have a friend who worked in Beijing for five years and I decided to, um, you know, um, see what life in China is like. So uh, with a friend, I decided to go on a holiday to China uh, first uh, to Beijing. Then because there's a nice uh, sleeper train going uh, between the two to Shanghai. Um, I didn't like Shanghai at the time because it rained all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, yeah, so so I actually had seen Shanghai and I actually had got an idea of what life um, and, and working in, Sh in China would be like still, um, you know, um, before that, I essentially, um, I was born in a city, I went to university in a city where I could actually, um, you know, the cities are so close together that on bike it's half an hour. Yeah. Um, so um and 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 then i got work and um for work i moved back to the city i was born in so um <laughs> yeah moving to shanghai all of a sudden is a is a pretty big uh, step but i was like you know um um, I, I, I don't I don't spend that much money so I had a, a, a um, yeah. essentially I was in a situation that even if I went to Shanghai and the entire company um, didn't exist then I, I could still go back to the Netherlands and be in a reasonable, reasonably comfortable position uh, with just a nice story to tell so I was like you know well, you don't um, get yeah 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 you, you you don't get get um uh, opportunities like this that often so maybe i should just go for it <laughs> so i did <laughs> and um yeah i haven't regretted it yet <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah and that and that brought us here and now you're on the amp hour mm -hmm. and you will regret it no i'm just kidding <laughs> uh oh <laughs> no i'm just kidding then <laughs> so how is it like in china where are you based Shanghai. Uh, I'm uh, yeah, I'm based in Shanghai. Uh, yep. Like in Expressive's headquarters are here. Uh, we also have uh, an office in Wuxi, uh, where uh, Expressive originally started. We are starting to have headquarters like in all over the world uh, because we're getting bigger and we're also getting more uh, international customers. And um, yeah. for example, for European customers, uh, the time zone difference can be uh, a problem uh, if you want to have support. Um, so yeah. we're so also how starting big offices. is Expressive? How many employees roughly? Um, it is um it's interesting because like in every time i tell that i i get the result that people are either overwhelmed or underwhelmed they either <laughs> expect like a much smaller or much bigger um i think we're at like in 100 uh, say 150 ish okay. people now that's probably more I than think, i expected but yep mm. yeah that's healthy though that's, well, that's a good sign yeah. that's mm -hmm. yeah and we're still growing like in see um, i think it would be different uh, though if so I'm guessing it's a fabulous organization, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. we are. If it it's, was uh, if it if you owned a fab, then that number would be three times that, right? Because you at, at least, yeah. yes. <laughs> just because of all the overhead stuff. So that's kind of just the, I yeah. feel like that's part of part and parcel of being a fabulous company. It's just you can have mm -hmm. less people. So Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's great. And so uh, okay, so you're you're doing software slash firmware there? <laughs> or hardware am, to what yeah i'm i'm, I'm doing all kinds of stuff yeah. um if anything i have the diversity in what i uh, uh what i want to do back um, <laughs> too much diversity I, <laughs> uh, sometimes you know you have to do accounting nice if there or would be. <laughs> are you <laughs> no, packing no, no, and shipping or what yeah. oh luckily no not yeah. that uh, <laughs> no but um like in my in my day-to-day -day job essentially still is like in software um i'm a software uh what's my official title again senior software engineering manager i think um uh, essentially, um, most of the time I take care of ESP IDF with uh, a bunch of people who also work on that. Uh, ESP IDF is the uh, SDK for like in the ESP32, which is our, our latest um, uh, chip. Um, uh, I kind of developed like in the original Artos implementation for that, ported it to be multi-core and now, um, yeah, it's essentially the base of the SDK we have. Um, 
but for instance, um, I'm also advising the digital team on, um, you know, uh, what would be a good idea to do with regards to the architecture. Um, I oh, also so like future um, for future stuff. You mean like you're kind of giving? Yeah, feedback? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's very great. much, very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of interesting because you know. Um, um, the nice thing of being on the bleeding edge of stuff is that you can make new stuff. The bad thing about being on the bleeding edge <laughs> is that you actually have to think of that new right, stuff. <laughs> right. Oh, no Which one else is, is going to uh, do this. Huh? Okay, well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's both very interesting as well as like in um, extremely frightening <laughs> somehow. <laughs> What? But still, you know, it's it's uh, uh, expressive consists of a bunch of very intelligent people, and I'm not the only one who, who has to make the decision. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we can come up with stuff that actually, you know, works. I mean, we've 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 done it in the past. There's no reason to, you know, uh, that 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 we make mistakes there. And um, yeah, uh, we do have a bunch of ideas that I think would be very much liked by uh, the market, and uh, you know electronic uh, fanatics um, you mean outside, uh, inside of just outside of just like how about cheaper <laughs> yeah, <you're right. laughs> yeah. well it's gotten to the point where it it's, it's pointless making it cheaper right yeah, right I, it's it's kind of well there there still is a point in there but um um uh, you know um i think easier is something though right i mean like because oh, it's easy still, is everything I think that I mean, you guys have like you're talking about like this this IDF and the multi core and all this mm-hmm. stuff, all the setup stuff, and it it already seems like in terms of dummies like me and Dave being able to get online, that's <laughs> awesome, yeah. right? From a community perspective and everything else, but from a like like what you were talking about with like the wake up, get online, go sleep, that kind of stuff is yeah. from an IoT perspective, that seems like that's the most important thing for battery life, and that's everything. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, uh, well, easier for a big part is like in a software thing. Um, mm-hmm. uh, as you already mentioned, for example, having Arduino support that is actually like you know, well developed and not just hey you can do digital write using uh, using our chip um, is actually pretty important. And um, uh, like in uh, uh, all the way we do it, essentially. Um, we do have developers for the Arduino port, like in in house, but there are also a bunch of other things. For example, you have MicroPython, and you have oh, yeah. the Lua port, yep. and you have mm. I think JavaScript, etc. And um, our our main approach with regards to those those um, uh, uh, those guys is essentially that we develop ESP IDF. As, as good as we can so those people can all use it as a basis without you know having to work around the things we have decided uh, but apart from that um, you know there are people who know Lua way better than we do there are people who know the intrinsics of MicroPython way better than we do so um, if they have questions with regards to ESP IDF or if they want to have changes then uh, we're happy to incorporate them but we leave the development of, of those things to those guys and that actually seems to work out pretty well um, um, uh, people like that are usually very happy that they get you know good support and um, still get to make like in all the, the language decisions. So oh yeah, um, right mm. yeah. That is Speaking interesting. Of languages, how much with how, you know, yeah. How is the <laughs> language? How is the language barrier been in China? Ah, By language, mean the, I mean the human language. The, the human <laughs> language, this pesky human language that we have to deal yeah, with. Yeah, it's um, uh, well. The nice thing is that um, you know English kind of um, um, uh, there are there 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 seem to be more and more people who speak English in China. Um, it still is um, you know like I come from the Netherlands and like everyone speaks English in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, um, so it's always going to be worse in China and. Um, uh, at work, it's not that much an issue because a lot of the engineers uh, speak um, at least understandable English. And mm-hmm. even if they don't, and they will usually poke a colleague and, and you know, you will have to, uh, yeah, you're essentially talking to two persons instead of one. And right. they will have some back talk every now and then. So that's not that much of an issue. Um, in daily life, uh, it kind of sort of is, but at a certain point, uh, even if you don't study Chinese full time, you develop what's known as taxi Chinese. <laughs> taxi so, Chinese, yeah. Yeah, right. um, es- yeah es- essentially <laughs> enough Chinese to be able to say, you know, um, uh, uh, left, yeah, I want to buy that thing, left, that thing, that thing. <laughs> left, right, stop, 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 like that. <laughs> <laughs> essentially, yes. <laughs> So, um, yeah, um, and I'm also trying to, 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 
uh, you know, work at it. Um, uh, like in uh, Espressive also helps out there by essentially hiring a Chinese um, uh, teacher uh, for like in all the Lao, all, oh, right. all the all the all the foreigners um, okay. in the uh, in the company and. Well, on one hand, um, Chinese is a pretty hard language. Um, mm. It's, um, you know, you've got the written Chinese, which is an entire right, different entirely story. Entirely different beast, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but also, you know, I'm used to learning languages that are spoken in Europe. And the nice thing is that there's a lot of overlap there. So, for right. example, if you know English, if you know French, then you can probably also get the gist of what an Italian guy says because, you know, it's, it's pretty... Yeah, uh, uh, similar, and and you can recognize words, and then you go to China, and like in everything is different, and they right. have like in only only a few loan words that you may be able to recognize, and even those, if you don't know them, they're mangled in such a way that only if you are later told that those are loan words, and you're like, ah, yeah, now you say I can actually, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, so. Um, um, uh, like in at least the spoken language, the biggest barrier is to actually, you know, get all the words and 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 get them into your head. And um, unfortunately, with a daytime job going on, and with um, you know me also trying to do some some electronic stuff um, uh, on the side in the evening, um, yeah, my Chinese could have been better. <laughs> Let me put it like that. You're not finding any du- native Dutch speakers in China? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> Uh, there are native Dutch speakers, but yeah. you know why would I? Uh, the, the the English community is so much bigger. I so right. I actually didn't expect you to have any native no. Dutch speakers there. So it's, yeah, there's, how, there's, there's a few. Yeah. How does working in in China go? Like, do you just turn up and do a job? Like, do you have to get a, a working visa? Do you have to have a company sponsor you? How does it? Oh, holy crap! Yeah, um. <laughs> that, that's easy, is it? <laughs> It's China is very, very good at bureaucracy. Let me put it like that. (laughs) It's, yeah, um, essentially, uh, let me think, that's more than two years ago. Uh, Well, the company offers you a job, right? The company's offered you a job and you go, yep, I'll take it. What was involved in in actually moving there and doing that? um, Essentially, what happened is that um, I think initially they have to take care of a bunch of things so you can actually get a a license to work there. And um, um, so uh, you send a whole bunch of stuff like in all your high school diplomas because maybe (laughs) it helps uh, to to them so they can, can communicate with their government you know instance that takes care of things Mm -hmm. then at a certain point you get this really shiny and and really it is a really nice looking um uh uh, on you know uh, printed on hardboard uh, uh, sorry on hard cardboard um, a document that says yes you're allowed to you know, come to China it's like, a, it's like a golden ticket <laughs> uh, yeah kind of sort of yeah, yeah. it looks really fancy um, um, so then you can use that to go to your local embassy I think then you get a Z visa which is um, uh, used to get into the country um, um, so then you can essentially, you know, go to China. Uh, then within China, um, you're allowed to get in, but you're not allowed to actually live there yet. Oh. So you have to get a residence permission first. And uh, <laughs> to do that, let's see, you have to... Um, you would have to do that before you turn up, I'm presuming. Uh, no, no. No, uh, yeah, just well, turn um, up and... Oh, uh, because you're it's, like it's, a tourist. It, if you turn up, you're like a tourist and then you've got a. Well, Why? yeah, sort of. The, the Z visa is, I think, uh, you can get into the country and that's it. So <laughs> right. as soon as you're in the country, you have to do like in all the other stuff. And um, uh, I, I think the idea is that if you can't get a residence permission, then your Z visa will at a certain point expire. So you're forced to get back. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, right. I'm not entirely sure. Oh, by the way, this is also like in information of two years ago. I right, think it's right. changed slightly. So... Um, well, you made it, so that's all that matters. You know, like, it's like you're allowed to leave, you're allowed to come back, so that's a good yeah, time. Yeah, right? yeah, that, that that seems to be, you know, I've crossed the border a few times and they still haven't stopped me, so that's Bingo. probably okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's prototyping right there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, just trial and error. Yeah. <laughs> and what about the infamous Great Firewall of China? Yeah, it's... Um, um, yeah. Is it is it it's, is it real? Is it a real thing? Is it easy oh, to yeah. circumvent? No. Is it? 
it's it's most definitely a real thing. Um, as in, if you go like into Google's website or Facebook website or whatever, mm. then you'll figure out that uh, unfortunately they have some technical issues. So. Um, <laughs> Can you watch YouTube? Yeah, oh, like I've, there, I think you can't even are, watch YouTube. Um, like <laughs> Dave's asking the questions for himself here. Let's let's be uh, yeah, honest. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's kind of my job. Yeah, I I I I, I can watch the EEV vlog and oh, you can? Uh, well, okay. It's it's you may uh, yeah. Um, um, essentially, what you do is you use a VPN. Um, so, oh, but, but you've um, got to have a VPN to do it. So normally you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, yeah, if you use a VPN, then essentially you can tunnel through the Great Firewall and um, end up in another location and then go to the internet and, and look at whatever is allowed in the Got location it. you end up in. Hmm. So, well, sounds like sounds you're making do. So <laughs> it's 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 a pain in the ass, but um, you know you learn to live with it. And, yeah. um, Speaking of, do you, I mean, so do you guys do you guys publish on like the? So I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there. Obviously, you mentioned Hackaday stuff like that, and other blogs mm-hmm. and forums and stuff like that. Do do you, does Espresso ever publish stuff in terms of how to get this thing online, or is it more community focused <sighs> that kind of thing? It's it's kind of sort of. Um, I think we do a bit, yeah, well, um, how to get this stuff online as in how to use the SDK. We have a documentation team for that okay. and, and they do an, an awesome job of, you know, um, if you look in the ESP IDF um, tree itself, um, you can uh, you can essentially see that there's not only like in all the function calls, etc., are well-defined. There's also some information on, hey, you bought our development board. How do you do st- stuff? Hey, you want to use JTAG? What kind of JTAG pods can you use? And uh-huh. how would you, for example, debug a, a sample application? And we essentially do that um, you know, in our own documentation because uh, we want to, um, stuff like that may change. If we decide to change, for example, our JTAG implementation and a bunch of commands you, you, you need to enter probably are different. And if you publish it anywhere else, then you essentially have an old article, which yeah, isn't right. up to date anymore, right. but which still <laughs> yeah. turns up. So, right. um, and then people go to production uh, if, and they're yeah, like, Hey, yeah, my yeah, part right. can't program. Okay, cool. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so if you keep that in your own documentation, then you're, you're almost forced to, 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 to keep it um, uh, up to date every time you change something mm-hmm. so that that works well for us um aside from that uh we also um uh, yeah well um the dirty little secret is that i that i have a second title which is a technical marketing manager oh no and dave we got one wah, 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 wah. <laughs> <laughs> honestly i have no well i, I didn't do mean have to I... I didn't know it was gonna happen <laughs> it's um that 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 kind of was the case. <laughs> um, um, Sorry, essentially, man. it happens, went like this. Happens to the um, best of us. I've had marketing in my title. It's fine. <laughs> essentially, it, it 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 worked like this. I I really like the the the. the you know, the chips we make also, you know, from a hacker perspective, I mean, it's got two cores, which means that you can do all kinds of fun stuff, which involves two cores. And it's got a bunch of memory, so you can do, you know. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I made uh, for the, well, at the time it was the ESP31, um, uh, which is, um, yeah, essentially the ESP32 beta. Um, I ported a uh, Sega, um, what's it, Sega Master System uh, emulator to it, just to nice. show, like, you know, this, this this may be a, a tiny little chip, but it can actually do like in a whole bunch of things. Um, the same well, thing. Um, so can you tell us about the ESP32? How is it oh, different yeah. from the AD? Because you, you're basically almost a two-device company, aren't you? You've got the classic mm. 8266 and now the ESP32 is like your your new... Yeah, kind uh, of, sort of. Are, yeah, you, um, are you trying to push people towards the ESP32 or, or are they um, like different market... <laughs> segments like well i am because i really like the sp32 <laughs> right <laughs> but, uh, that's, but but that's is not it company like a higher co- but is it a higher cost chip are you ever going to make the 32 for the same as the 62 82 66 etc uh, we may um essentially the story is there that the um 8266 essentially is um a spin off of another chip the 
8089 if I recall correctly and you probably never heard of that chip um, uh, which is because it's um, well um, let me go back a bit um, Espressive essentially started um, uh, with the development of Wi-Fi chips because they saw that uh, you know Chinese uh, um, at that time like in tablets were really big and you had mm -hmm. the market was flooded with, with well also cheap Chinese tablets and um, those tablets usually used a Wi-Fi module because, um, you know, uh, doing Wi-Fi actually is pretty hard. And at the time you had um, a bunch of Wi-Fi chips who needed a whole bunch of glue logic around that mm -hmm. that would be actually, you know, carrying that 2.4 gigahertz signal. Um, which is pretty much a pain in the ass because you have to take care with your PCB to oh, do yeah, like in, sure. um, yeah, yeah. Um, so the way they solve that is to make a little module with a chip on it, and and you know that 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 module PCB could be like in really nice and and and, and you know controlled impedance and, and all that sort of stuff, and they would put it like in on their main board, which was like in cheap ass Chinese, uh, you know, uh, four layer, you know, uh, just Shenzhen uh, crank something out uh, stuff. Um, but the problem is that the, you know, um, uh, making the module actually, you know, costs a bit, like in maybe it's, it's, it's uh, 50 cents or something. So, um, the, uh, the, the opportunity that, is, uh, that Espresso uh, tried to exploit and, and well, succeeded pretty well in that was that if you make uh, a Wi-Fi chip that is cheap and doesn't require any external components that, you know, carry like in, um, a, a 2.4 gigahertz signal that is, that is really sensitive, um, and, and also has a bunch of auto calibration so it can adjust itself to whatever, you know, cheap ass cardboard PCB it's, <laughs> it's, it's based it on <laughs> yep. then 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 you know you can you can save the cost of making the module and um that was the esp8089 uh which is essentially a tablet wi-fi chip right um but they also had the idea, you know, IoT is an up and coming market and maybe we can, you know, just tweak the design a little bit so we can also do something with IoT because maybe there, 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 there are a few people interested in that. So um, <laughs> in essence, they made a second variation of that chip, which has uh, the capability to uh, run like in its own standalone program from external flash. And that became the uh, ESP8266. And um, at first, it really was meant as an application uh, thing, and 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 that's where the where the proprietary SDK that leaked came in, and only later, uh, like in Espressive, was kind of like holy crap, there are so many people interested in this. So the entire chip itself actually was designed as a Wi-Fi chip for tablets, with the IoT bit only thrown in as almost an afterthought, I would say. Um, so um, that is the reason why, for example, the ESP8266 has so few peripherals and only yeah. has one ADC channel and stuff like that. Right. And for the ESP32, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, we wanted to do it the other way around. So we, de we designed a chip that was first and foremost made for IoT. And secondly, you can probably also use it to, you know, um, uh, get Wi-Fi and Bluetooth into your tablet if you really want to. What does that um, mean, design it for the Internet of Things? What are the requirements? Like if you're... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to design a chip and it's focused on the Internet of Things. What does it need? Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, as you probably know, the uh, Internet of Things is a really, really <laughs> fuzzy and <laughs> badly defined um, uh, term. I mean, I think uh, sensors. Sensors is probably a good yeah, incoming well, thing, right? Um, essentially, you know, um, uh, we leave the definition of the Internet of Things to, uh, you know, the, the people who actually make Internet of Things uh, things uh, yeah but they make the internet of things things with your thing <laughs> <laughs> but you know nice. uh, the basic you need for an internet of things thing is like in connectivity and we have that which is right. like in wi-fi of and course. bluetooth as well as ptle um and apart from that you want to have uh, you know that's that that's essentially the internet side sorted and then you want to make your thing and your thing essentially is like in anything you could normally plunk a microcontroller in but now you plunk a microcontroller in it that can connect to the cloud. Ooh, um, the cloud. <laughs> so, um, um, essentially, uh, all you need on the other side is a capable microcontroller and a lot of peripherals so you can interface with whatever you want to interface in uh, yeah. uh, uh, with. So um, there are quite a few on this thing. I yeah, mean, like, so you need yeah. ADCs, DACs, PWMs. 
you know exactly uh, exactly comparable um, so to, yeah yeah we have we have a whole bu- a bunch of peripherals that can be used for like in the things they're meant to plus a whole bunch of peripherals that can be used for things that you know you don't um uh, we didn't design to uh, have them used for um on uh, the kinda... on, on the comms side of things just one thing like mm-hmm. you know you mentioned bluetooth ble i find ble yeah. a pain in the ass i'm developing a ble product at the moment is there, there's a new i've heard there's a new bluetooth 5 mm-hmm. coming out have you dealt with that do you think that'll yeah, solve uh, issues with BLE or whatnot? I've heard it might. I haven't really looked into it. Um, to be honest, I am more knowledgeable on the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi side okay. of things. Cool. Um, so, um, Thought yeah, I'd ask. I heard a few things would come out, uh, but I'm not sure if they make, like in the API, where you as a developer would you know, use, mm. uh, if they would make that any easier. Okay. But I got to admit, that's not my... my Fuel of specialty, so <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, yeah. With hindsight, I should have put in a um, ESP thirty two in instead of just a BLE module. You know, so anyway. Well, how do you? Learned. I mean, Sprite. How do you find? How do you find the people are are approaching? You? Are they like we're definitely putting down a module? Are people actually putting down the the chipset and they're like, oh, well, we? I mean, is it possible to get the chipset on its own, or is it has to have yeah. the module? No, it's very well possible, and yeah. people people actually do that. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of sort of 50-50, I think. Uh-huh. Um, you have got, at least on the... Um, like, and it seems that the um, European and Western developers are more keen on just buying a module and using that because they don't have to worry about the least certification of that bit mm-hmm. um, and stuff like that. Um, I have the idea that the Chinese manufacturers like to just plunk in, uh, yeah, either either um, the cheapest you know, thing plunk possible, in the raw chip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or or they essentially um, uh, custom design a module for their own use because you know yeah. the Chinese manufacturers usually are like in the bigger ones um so they like tier have 2 tier been, 1 manufacturer type thing yeah they 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 they, they want to have a module they can use in a lot of of their products and they um, essentially want to you know custom design that entirely to their own purposes so um you know in essence they're buying the chip uh, from us but they're still using modules in their products mm-hmm. right <clears throat> yeah that's great I mean, it's it's kind of insane how many... I mean, so this is the trend that we see on here all the time, right? So we see... Mm-hmm. I talk about analog chips getting, you know, shrunk into packages. Obviously, the ESP32 has got everything on board, right? I mean, it's... Yeah. Uh, and obviously, it's low cost. It's got Wi-Fi. It's got Bluetooth. I mean, mm-hmm. so I guess I kind of see what you're talking about when you said, where does it go from here? Like, <laughs> what else do you even put in there, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, there, there, there are a few things uh, we can do. I mean, there's also the, uh, the there, there's always the bit, you'll always have applications that, that either need more CPU power or need to be lower power, so to say. Yeah. Um, like, and everyone wants a device, um, uh, you know, that can sing and dance while they only have to put in like in one AA and it'll right. live for like in 10 years. <laughs> right. So um, at least that's an optimization. Um, uh, yeah, aside from that, you know, tweaking the peripheral set is is maybe not as glamorous as, you know, ah, we designed a whole new uh, uh, chipset architecture. But um, well, I think... Hmm? Speaking of which, like, mm-hmm. are you, would you want to move to like an ARM? Like, are you still going to push along with the 10 silica? Because, like, some people think that this, oh, it's running Linux, like, or whatever. It must be a, like an ARM, you know, uh, type processor. Well, Whereas it's, it's, yeah. that's, it's a 10 silica. It's, it's its own totally yeah. different um, processor architecture. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's also not, not running Linux. It's running for oh, uh, right. It's more of an embedded thing because yep. you only have... Well, you only have like in half a megabyte of RAM to work with. Um, But but, but that operating system had to be ported to that 10 silica processor, you know, and then you've got to maintain it and yeah everything else right so it's um actually free artos um uh, uh initially wasn't uh, capable of handling dual core stuff uh, ah, that is right. one of the one of the things i did when the esp32 uh still was in was in beta initially they meant to use the esp32 solely as a 
Uh, yeah, the CS term is AMP, uh, asynchronous multiprocessing. So essentially, um, you have a dual core, but it essentially looks like you took like in two discrete microcontrollers and just smashed them together with a <laughs> communication bus in, in, in between. And uh, <laughs> one of the things I actually did was like in, you know, if we could share some memory regions, then we can essentially make a symmetric multi-core processor, which uh, essentially allows you to... Mailboxes. Uh, yes? Uh, yeah, well, not only mailboxes. Uh, it makes stuff a lot more transparent on the programmer side because essentially oh. uh, FreeRTOS is multi-threading. Mm -hmm. So you, you start up multi multiple threads anyway but you don't have to worry on which course your threads are running you can um, either if you want control you can say hey I want this thread to run on core one and this thread to run on core two and they can just talk to each other using uh, like in the same things you would use to uh, communicate between threads and yeah. um, uh, it's 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 Semifold entirely transparent not... yeah exactly and it's entirely transparent that that you you're actually running on two cores um, uh, but if you want to, you can also, for example, say, hey, um, I don't care whatever CPU this, this is running on. I just want like in the most, um, uh, the most power possible. So, uh, you know, uh, run my thread on whichever CPU has the most free time. And, and that is really powerful if you want to, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, have applications that need a lot of computing power. So essentially, I was like, yeah, you know, all we need to do is make the free RTOS uh, dual, uh, dual core. And, um, <laughs> I think my colleagues weren't as enthusiastic as I was. <laughs> yeah, right. But um, uh, the digital team essentially was, yeah, whatever, that's a small change. We can incorporate that. And, you know, if that doesn't work out, then we can always use it as an uh, asymmetric uh, uh, processor. And I actually came up with, like, in a proof of, a proof of concept, um, shoehorning the asymmetric nature of the the beta silicon into something that could be used as a symmetric multi-core processor and i actually had a proof of concept with like in multiple threads migrating and stuff and that is essentially why the sp32 now is a symmetric uh, multi-core processor instead of an asymmetric one that's awesome yeah. What about the so, uh, so like so we kind of mentioned so dave asked if it was linux based and you said it's our free rtos based yeah. and i mean could you give us like some some power differences and stuff like that just to i mean like I assume free RTOS because it's just a little bit closer to the metal would be mm -hmm. lower, you know, like more power control over that kind of stuff. Is that is that a good assumption or no? Uh, yeah, uh, the, um, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to say because there's so much that that, that depends on other things as well. Um, sure, like anything, anyone's going to optimize for for their application the best power yeah, for yeah, their yeah. application. But um, if anything, running running Linux on this device is pretty hard because Linux, um, unless you tweak it to a point where you almost can't call it Linux anymore, yeah. uh, and needs like in um, uh, from a standpoint of embedded RAM and an embedded device needs a I think the technical term is metric fuckton of RAM. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's 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 like in um, now. Nowadays, you can probably get away with like in eight megabytes, but eight megabytes is really cramped. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if you're used to your AVRs, if you're used to your ARMs, etc., eight megabytes is yep. is huge. It's enormous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And 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 DSP thirty two actually already is is pretty big. I, I think we have like in half a megabyte of RAM. And if you look at the silicon die, that that's like in three fourths of, of of the silicon or something, if I recall correctly. It's 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 a lot. Um, so uh, given that, if you want to use Linux, you either have to use external RAM, and if you want to use external RAM, uh, like in um, uh, with in, 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 in those amounts, you're almost forced to add an external DDR um, memory right. part to it, which means that you have high-speed signaling going on, uh, and all of a sudden uh, you're designing an entirely yeah. different product. Not, yes. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, essentially, we're, we're using free artists because Linux, you know, just never was in the picture. It's not an option. So it doesn't probably affect, I mean, you talked about all these software stacks that are built on top of this stuff the sdk mm -hmm. though right so it, for most people it should be pretty uh not it's not insignificant but it, it should be less significant if they're writing in their own language that yeah, they're used to um, stuff like that right <clears throat> essentially the way our our sdk works right now is that you essentially have the uh, standard uh you know bsd socket set to play with so um 
Essentially, if you write an application under Linux that is single threaded and uses sockets, then you can pretty much just copy paste it to ESP IDF and um, it'll work. Hmm. Um, uh, because, you know, the API to, to create sockets and send stuff over the internet is the same. So um, with uh, uh, in that respect, it should actually be pretty easy. Uh, if you want to do uh, like in real multi-threading, then um, um, you'll probably have to read up on the free Artos SDK, although we have a pthread stuff as well. So if you have a somewhat small multi-threading uh, Linux application, you may actually be able to port that without too much too much issues. Okay. So, but yeah, the the thing I'm saying is that you know all the APIs are actually pretty well known and well documented. So, um, you know, it shouldn't be that hard to uh, develop an application for uh, ESP IDF uh, compared to developing an application for Linux. Okay. All right. So it's like a kind of starting to wrap up question here. Um, mm-hmm. What about people that are starting to put this into products? I mean, I've seen some uh, some products that are using the modules, some that are using the chips, stuff like that. But are mm-hmm. there are there pitfalls that you know people listening should watch out for, like for for sourcing sourcing parts from Espressif or you know sourcing modules or or even designing firmware and like uh, programming chains around this stuff? Like what mm-hmm. what's the usual? best guidelines that you have for that? Like, for example, if I'm designing a widget and I have to suddenly manufacture a million widgets, right. can you yep. guys supply yeah. me with a million chips? I mean, or million modules. widgets. Or even, like, yeah, <laughs> distribution channels, too. Like, I mean, I've seen some some widgets, some widgets, some modules in, in the distribution channels, but not many, you know? Yeah, to be fair, I don't have that good of an eye on our distribution channels because, hey, if I want an ESP32, I'll just go to the office <laughs> and grab one from there. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, gets one, everybody yeah. gets benefits from work, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Per- <laughs> perks of the job. I so. actually control the airwaves. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, um, I think if you want to have, like, in uh, multiple... Uh, ESP 32s for example and million um, yeah. <laughs> well just, no, just no, no, million. Let, let, just let's say 50,000 100,000 which can be a nothing quantity for a like a toy or something or some other product that's going to you know yeah, we yeah, need yeah. it done no. by by his yeah, time I, 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 so. I happen to be uh, like in also on the user side a little bit because I am actually developing one of my projects into an actual product. Oh, fancy! Um, and it uses an ESP32, so of that course. goes down nicely yep. on well, that is <laughs> which su- ones that, is that surprising, could be. I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, as far as I know, if you need like in five thousand or something, uh, then uh, I think it's best to just contact our sales channel. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. I think the email address is sales at espressive.com. So it's pretty simple. And um, I think they can help you. Um, there are also resellers, but for the life of me, I can't remember who those <laughs> yeah, are. But they, so. the, but they wouldn't have stock of that sort of quantity. Right. You know, if you right. want at a certain 10, point, you got to go to the, 000, 20, the factory. 000, you've yeah. got to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that'll, that'll be. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, but it's pretty likely that yeah, they'll also send you to you know uh, the espresso uh, website. I mean, if people so are contact s- them it, before you start on your design, <laughs> yeah, that's not what after. Call. Oh, I finished it, and by the way, can you give me fifty thousand next week? Right. Like yeah, you you, know. you probably have uh, a certain uh, <laughs> uh, delay. I, I, I think <laughs> we stock a fair few ESP thirty twos, but you know, especially with larger sizes, there'll always be like in yeah, we gotta have those manufacturers yeah. first yep. well you you so you only make two chips that's it you said three, that, yeah. um, you said three. three sorry yeah at the moment i think we have um yeah the, the, essentially we have four chips i th- right. think at the moment so you've got the esp 866 plus the uh variant which is used for like in tablet uh, use like in embedded use with a host um a linux uh, uh processor or something we also have the esp32 with uh, a similar um uh, uh, a companion chip which can be used uh, uh, if you want to add wi-fi and bluetooth to, to your linux uh, device mm-hmm. 
um, we are working on a chip that hopefully will be out um, like in at the end of this year which is going to be um, it's going to be pretty similar to the ESP32 but it's going to have a few improvements and um, I think the idea is that it's going to be slightly lower cost and but obviously we have future chips in the pipeline <laughs> yeah the secret stuff the stuff that you hold yes. behind the curtain that's okay. Yeah. Has there ever been any hint of companies in China looking to clone this thing? Um, is is that a concern or is it? It's it's. Well, the thing is that. Um, is it hard to do? Would it be hard to? Yeah. Well, the thing about cloning is, if you, for example, look at, um, uh, you know, the FTDI chip, yeah, the FT right, that, that's a classic example. That one's yeah. been cloned up the wazoo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you if you look at those clones, um, then um, essentially they're not literally clones of the silicon. It's not some. Uh, it's not that someone ran no, off with the mask just and just duplicated the same. them. Right. They, they're 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 yeah. they're they're an entirely different architecture that just happened to react <laughs> in a similar way if you <laughs> right. connect it to USB and a serial thing and yeah. um, I think uh, uh, you, you know a lot of the uh, clone chips work like that uh, they're mm -hmm. essentially chips that, that that look and feel the same but the internal architecture is entirely different obviously if you go down to like in the the, the, the simpler chips like the 74 XX series right. then yeah. they are almost literal clones but the clone the complex clones are more like you know simulators than real clones Got it. and um, if you if you would have to use that in our chip then you would essentially have to develop <laughs> a Wi-Fi right? <laughs> process yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything from scratch exactly yeah. it, what, it, 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 what it, we it did would... is we looked at the Wi-Fi standard then we looked at the Bluetooth standard and then we made a chip <laughs> 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 that's right good luck yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so essentially yeah um, uh, if you have a company that can do that they'll bring out their own chip right. because there's no reason right. for them to clone ours got it yeah. that's great excellent <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Sprite, this has been awesome. I heard rumor you will be at the Super Conference in Pasadena. Uh, yes, I will do my very best. I'll have to come up with, with an interesting talk again, which is always right. like in a scramble. But and we, uh, <laughs> Well, we will definitely... Uh, that's the stuff I mentioned at the beginning, or maybe I just mentioned to Dave at the beginning, but we will have... I'll, I'll link those in because the Tamagotchi talk, the Snake talk... What was the other one? Oh, the mini Game Boy talk. Yeah, those mm -hmm. those three, man. They're, they're killer. They're really fun talks. <laughs> so... Mm. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much. Where, where can people find you online? Uh, well, my main website is spritesmod.com, uh, which unfortunately hasn't been updated in a while because I've done mm. all kinds of other stuff that didn't really fit there. Uh, I'm planning to, to put something up there soon again. Mm. And aside from that, I don't know, GitHub, Twitter, IRC, the usual places, I guess. Okay. <laughs> we'll, f we'll find them all. We'll link them all like we usually do. And so. your Sprites sure. mod on Twitter? Uh, yes, I think that's what my uh, my official account is called. It's also yeah. slightly silent, but I'll probably... I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I've got something in the pipeline that takes up a lot of my time that I'll probably have done uh, at the Hackaday conference. So I can say a bit more about it then. Um, but after that, I'll probably increase my frequency of posting articles and interesting stuff uh, uh, a bit again. Awesome. Cool. Well, Sprite, thanks so much for telling us about this stuff. I'm sure we'll have lots of comments about in the comment section about what it all is happening with ESP stuff is really it's really exciting time yeah sure I'll, I'll keep an eye on it I like reading about what people do with, with the chips awesome thanks man we'll talk soon mm -hmm. see ya sure bye